Welcome back to part two of this three-part series on neurodevelopment. Um, just as a reminder, in the first segment, we discussed uh, how amazing it is that uh, you can begin with a single fertilized egg and end with a, a functional adult brain. We started talking about some of the processes and mechanisms by which this happens. As a reminder, we talked about the goals of neurodevelopment. The three main goals, first of all, that the different cells must differentiate. Uh, there are different types of neurons and glial cells, supporting cells within the brain. And so they, they must differentiate into those different types and multiply. Obviously there's more than just one neuron in the brain. So there's a lot of um, division that must occur. And then the cells must also find their way to the appropriate locations within the brain. And they must also establish appropriate connections or synapses with other cells so that they're able to, to function properly. In the last segment, we started talking about the five phases of neurodevelopment. Specifically, we talked about the induction of the neural plate and neural proliferation. And in this segment, we'll be talking about migration of those newly formed uh, neurons and also um, the growth of axons and synapse formation. And um, we'll also talk about how neuronal death, program neuronal death and synapse rearrangement are part of uh, typical neurodevelopment. And then in the, the next segment, we'll talk a little bit more about how the, the maturation of the brain corresponds with the ability um, to do certain functions such as a language and uh, sensory and motor skills and things like that. Okay, so in terms of migration, uh, the neurons originate in the subventricular and ventricular zones. So um, the ventricles are those fluid filled cavities within the brain uh, they're filled with cerebral spinal fluid and provide support to the brain so it doesn't collapse in on itself. We know that the brain is uh, made of very soft tissue, and so the, the ventricles uh, provide some support there. The neurons originate near the ventricles, and then they need to migrate out from the ventricles to the developing cortex. And they do that by means of following a radial glial cells, which we'll discuss further in a moment. And then the cortex, those cortical layers are established in an inside first, outside last fashion. We'll discuss that further in a moment. And this process of migration typically occurs between the 12th and the 24th weeks of gestation. So about the third to six months. Radial glia are a special type of developmental glia. Um, they provide the pathway for the developing neurons as they migrate out from the proliferating ventricular layer. These radial glia are present early in neural development and many of them will later uh, become astrocytes. So as I mentioned, these neurons originate in the ventricular zone. So in this figure here on the right, you can um, imagine that this is a ventricular zone. So that zone that's very um, near the ventricles. And we have these uh, germinal cells shown in green here. Now these neurons uh, climb up these radial fibers, which are shown as these uh, lines extending from the ventricular zone up to the, the cortical plate here. And, um, and so you can see these little neurons uh, climbing up the radial glial fibers uh, past this subplate here. And these neurons then uh, deposit themselves at the outermost layer of the cortical plate. So these, uh, these climbing neurons will pass the subplate, they'll pass the, the layers of neurons that were laid down earlier and establish themselves in that outermost layer of the cortex. So this means that layer six of the cortex is deposited first 
and layer one or the outside layer is deposited last. And that may seem surprising or maybe even counterintuitive um, that it would uh, organize itself that way, but that is um, what we observe. So once these neurons have migrated from the ventricular and subventricular zones to the to establish the cortex, the axons and dendrites uh, need to form. And they do this first by forming neurites, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the axons need to find their correct path to establish connections with other neurons. And once the axons find their target, there are proteins in the pre and postsynaptic membranes that, um, that help these synapses to, to form. Okay, so formation of axons and dendrites. So there are a few steps in the formation of axons and dendrites. As shown here in the figure on the right in stage one, uh, small lamellipodia are formed, these little protrusions that extend out from the developing neuron. In stage two, these uh, neurites grow and become longer. Uh, in stage three, one of these neurites will actually become the axon. And as it does that, the axon releases signals that prevent any more axons from forming. And so the rest of these neurites will become the dendrites. As you see here, these dendrites can then branch and lengthen. And um, there are uh, spines that also form on the dendrites. And this allows for additional connections with other neurons. As you can see here, the axon has this double line uh, indicating that it is longer than is shown here in this figure. As uh, some attractant molecules, so you can see that that might attract that axon to grow towards uh, those, those molecules. You can also have chemorepulsions. So, so cells can release chemicals that or molecules that repulse that axon. So in this case, we have this axon that started to come down here and then changed course due to the chemorepulsion. And then there can also be contact inhibition. Um, so in, so these cells, instead of allowing that framework or, or providing that framework for the axon to grow along, um, it will uh, repulse or inhibit uh, the axon from growing along that cell. And so by, by means of all of these mechanisms, an axon is able to find its way or create its path um, sometimes uh, across uh, fairly large distances. Now, once the, the axons and the dendrites have formed, they need to form synapses with other neurons. There are proteins on both the presynaptic axon and also the postsynaptic membrane. And these proteins work together to form a synapse. So you can see this here in the diagram on top um, that, uh, so you have the, the presynaptic and the postsynaptic membranes forming uh, this, this connection here. And down below we see a, kind of a, a larger picture of what is happening. So you have the developing um, axon here, it establishes the, the target and creates that synapse there. And you can see those, those protein molecules and other things that are going on within the, the presynaptic and the postsynaptic uh, neuron to create that connection. And these protons help to organize that synapse and also to make sure that the correct neurons synapse on the correct receptors. Now these axons can synapse on dendrites. They can also, also synapse on the neuronal cell bodies as well as on other axons. So that there are different types 
of synapses that can form. And then step five here is uh, the death of some neurons and rearrangement of, of the synapses. And it, again, it may be surprising that death is a, a normal part of de development, but, but some of the neurons that are formed during development will, will not survive. Um, and some of the connections between neurons will also not survive. And this helps uh, make the, uh, the, again, this is part of normal development that helps make, make the, the connections that do remain, it, it, it makes sure that they are more um, specific to the types of functions that are needed. Astrocytes and microglia are, are types of glial cells that help keep useful synapses strong, and they also help to prune away the synapses that are less helpful. Um, again, synapses are not permanent. There are periods of time during development when the synapses are more susceptible to change. And there are mechanisms such as long-term potentiation and long-term depression that uh, play major roles in synapse rearrangement and learning. And so we'll, we'll talk about each of these um, topics in more detail. Okay, first of all, the role of astrocytes and microglia. There are signals from astrocytes that help to promote the formation of synapses and help to, to keep those synapses strong. So we see here uh, a, a drawing of, of an astrocyte and here's the, the neuron. Um, and then we also have these my, microglia that prune uh, and eliminate synapses that are unnecessary. Hebb's postulate states that cells that fire together, wire together. That's a saying that you might commonly hear. And basically it means that synapses that fire at the same time and rate are most likely to be communicating information that is useful or relevant. So those are the synapses that will be strengthened. So you can see that um, shown here in this figure on top, these three synapses here, they are firing at the same time and rate. It's more likely that those synapses are going to be strengthened and maybe even uh, produce additional um, synaptic connections there. On the other hand, cells that fire out of sync lose their link, uh, meaning that synapses that fire randomly or not at the same time as a stimulus will be pruned out. And it's likely that those signals are not um, relevant to the particular stimulus. And so these um, synapses are more likely to be pruned out. You may, all, may, you may have heard the term uh, plasticity or neuroplasticity. Now that doesn't mean that the brain is plastic, but uh, it refers to some of the refinement of those synaptic connections. And this is this most frequently occurs during the critical period or sensitive periods of development. Uh, typically, this begins at about six months of age uh, and peaks between one, one to three years and then tends to fade away at about eight to 10 years of age. We know that different brain regions uh, have different critical periods during development, and they are also associated with different brain functions, which we'll talk about. Now, this figure uh, may look like a bunch of spaghetti, but these different uh, lines refer to different functions and the sensitive periods uh, with which they are associated during early brain development. So for example, we have um, here this black line, which represents the development of uh, number skills, familiarity with, with numbers and how they work. And so that peaks at about uh, two to three years of age and then, um, and then fades uh, later on. <clears throat> 
You also have uh, the vision shown here in white and hearing that those peak very early on and, um, and later on in age, uh, the, the parts of the brain that are, are associated with them um, are much less susceptible to uh, some of that uh, plasticity. We know that uh, the, the connections for different brain functions develop in a sequence. So in the, the previous slides, you saw that uh, the, the sensitive periods for hearing and vision occurred early on. Uh, so those functions, those sensory pathways develop very early on in development. Language develops a little bit later. And some of the, the higher cognitive functions develop later still. And we will be talking more about that in segment three of this neurodevelopment lecture series. This period of uh, critical periods or sensitive periods also corresponds with the time frame during which the brain is, is growing fairly rapidly. So um, in the first year or so of life, the brain is growing quite rapidly. And then there enters a, a, a period of time where the brain is still growing, but it's not growing as rapidly. And then starting about six years of age, and the, the volume of the brain has pretty much stabilized. Even so, there's still a, a, a significant amount of rearrangement of the synapses that is occurring after that point. Now I had mentioned the mechanisms of long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So long-term potentiation is the process by which um, synapses will be continually strengthened. And long-term potentiation also creates um, a, a stronger connection so that that signal between neurons will be strengthened. Long-term depression, on the other hand, is the process that decreases the strength of certain synapses. So uh, those, those connections will not be as effective. And both long-term potentiation and long-term depression are important mechanisms uh, for synaptic plasticity throughout life. Um, it's not just during the critical period that uh, these mechanisms are in force. So this slide shows the timing of some neurodevelopmental events, some of which we've already talked about. So we talked um, in the last segment about neurogenesis, the, the creation of new neurons. And that happens um, very early on after conception before birth. So you can see um, that that creation of new neurons uh, fades, uh, typically within the first year of life, although there, there continues to be neurogenesis in certain regions of the brain. Uh, you see here in green, uh, the, the creation of glial cells, and then here in purple, synaptogenesis. So you can see that even before birth, there is a significant prolifer pro proliferation of these connections between neurons. And that peaks at about two years of age and then synaptogenesis continues, but at a slower rate later on in childhood and early adolescence. You see here in red, uh, the onset of uh, some of that synaptic pruning. So in the developing brain, there are more connections formed than are needed. And so some of those synapses are pruned out uh, so the, the connections that remained are, um, uh, are more relevant to the functions that the brain actually needs to perform. So the synaptic pruning is associated with refinement of those synaptic, uh, of those connections within the brain at those synapses. So, so far we've been talking about typical brain development. 
um, as it relates to migration and um, the creation of synapses and the pruning of synapses. But we recognize that um, in some individuals, that pattern, uh, that, that typical pattern does not occur. So here, the black line represents the typical pattern for synapse formation, synapse, synaptic elimination or synaptic pruning and maintenance over the lifespan. Now, if there are too many synapses that form, so over and above the typical amount in early childhood, that may be associated with um, autism spectrum disorder. And you can see that uh, there is an increased number of synapses uh, throughout the lifespan. On the other hand, um, there may be individuals that have uh, approximately the right number of synapses that, that form, but those synapses may be eliminated at a higher rate than is typical. And this may be associated with schizophrenia. So that by early childhood and adolescence, you see a lower number of those synapses than you would expect in, in typical development. There are also individuals who may show that typical rate of synapse formation, typical rate of synapse elimination, and then especially in older adulthood, there may be a, a pruning of those synapses and that can be associated with Alzheimer's dementia. So different uh, patterns that emerge and are associated with different types of, of disorders. So in Alzheimer's uh, dementia, for example, that's thought to be associated with uh, cognitive decline, although there are, there are other mechanisms taking place in, in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and with that, we will end this segment. And in the next segment, we will be talking more about um, the brain functions and how they are associated with uh, maturation of the brain.